And now we will have the pleasure to talk maybe more, even more concretely about uh, this role of basic sciences in developing societies. So I have the pleasure to call on stage two of our panelists, Dr. Hani Helal should be here. Um, Professor Hani Helal is Excellency, the former Minister of Scientific Research and Higher Education. Please from the Arab Republic of Egypt. I hope uh, our Nobel Prize Professor Barry Barish is, is around also. 2017 Nobel Laureate in Physics from the USA. Enveloped by your gravitational waves, Barry. And, uh, I hope Dr. Karen Halberg is, is there also. Karen, please. You're a physicist. You're a research director at the Bariloche Atomic Center in Argentina, Argentine Republic. And two more panelists in video, live in video from China, Dr. Rui Bai, I hope I pronounce its way, uh, all right, Life Science, Westlake University, the People's Republic of China, she's online, I hope we will see her, and Dr. Francine Tumi, Medical Science, President and Director General of the Congolese Foundation for Medical Research, Republic of Congo. Happy to have at least three of the panelists here. Um, uh, formerly, and uh, we, ha we, we had a title, which was a very long title. I don't know if you had it uh, under your eyes. Um, it was, uh, the question was, how do scientists contribute to the progress toward the sustainable development goals with their results? and also in the way they are working and interacting with society. So, you know, such a long question, we had to, to cut it in parts. So, uh, Karen, Barry, and Hani, I hope you'll, 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 you'll answer at least the first question. Um, what we'd like to know is your own results and how they relate to one of the SDGs, maybe of more than one. So, who would like to start? Barry? Yes. So, I, re I remind everybody that Barry uh, is, is, is a Nobel Prize and uh, is an astronomer, but working, working firmly on the ground, on the ground which has to be very, very stable so that you get your results. So, how what you did with gravitational waves or whatever work you did as a physicist relates to, to SDGs. Well, I, I think the, the thing that uh, strikes me the most and is related to the subject of today, sustainability, is a kind of a unique feature of science and, and that is that science has no borders. Sp Countries have borders. Speak, speak really in the microphone so that okay. we can hear you very well. Yeah, I said the feature that I'd like to talk about a little bit is that uh, science itself has no borders. Science for around the world is the same, whether you're learning quantum mechanics, whether we discover something like we heard this morning, like the Higgs boson, it has the same importance and meaning around the world or not necessarily uh, physics, but uh, other subjects of science like CRISPR or even gravitational waves have the same meaning around the world. And the, that's maybe not 100% unique to science, but it's unique. And it makes, makes the enterprise the most important and the most useful and the most powerful in terms of the world and sustainability, I think, if the science, as it's practiced, 
is a worldwide uh, enterprise. And so collaborate, large collaborations like we heard about this morning a little bit and more we'll hear about this afternoon, like CERN, uh, is, uh, is a big step forward. Uh, in, if we think back historically, the laboratory, the CERN laboratory was developed and built and put together to bring science together in Europe after the World War II. And so to see the expansion of it taking a role in worldwide science and the importance of science is very important. But as mentioned by Hirosh this morning, that's not the only, we don't have to do it through such big institutions. Um, we do it in small collaborations. We do it in larger collaborations like the one that I've been responsible for in gravitational waves. Uh, in our case, which I'll just mention, it has no, it has funding from governments, but it has no, author governments have no authority over us. It's a scientific collaboration, just as others here might have scientific uh, collaborations with no government uh, influence. Uh, we have uh, more than a thousand scientists around the world from around 100 institutions in 20 or so countries that participate in different ways. And it's done in a way that doesn't have, let's say, the problems that governments have serving their own uh, community, having borders, having economics that influence it. And it seems to me that gives us a unique uh, situation in order to uh, propagate sustainability, that science should be propagated and have a big priority to be worldwide, to be collaborative, to be open. We hear about uh, openness and whether we do it well or we don't do it well. Uh, in my field, a big thing had been, has been for years trying to have open access, what we call open access. That is, should the journals, if they publish gravitational waves or something else, be open to everyone? And we are trying hard to do that. There's problems economically with supporting journals if you do that, but that's the kind of goals that it seems to me we have to have, to have as scientists. We don't do everything well, so we have some problems that I think we should admit up front and do better. If we're trying to involve everybody or equally in science, we certainly have to do better at uh, uh, gender equality, for example, um, where we should have as many women as men in okay, science. Ba okay, Barry, but when, when we prepared that, uh, uh, that round table, you insisted on, just, just to make things clear, uh, uh, goal 17. That's right. Partnerships. Right. To achieve, to achieve the other goals. And well, you just mentioned gender equality. And right. I think I'll pass on the, 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 the microphone to Karen because you. you insisted on yes. that. So could you, could you remind us what, what you do exactly? Uh, I would say, well, you're a physicist. You're in Bariloche Atomic Center. This time again, how does it relate? You, you, you're not going to talk only about gender equality, but you're going to talk about that too. Okay, so thank you so much, Barry, for just uh, giving me the, the, the responsibility, and thank you so much, uh, uh, Dominique, for your question. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, yes, I would like to touch on this topic on, on gender equality. It's a, a very important SDG. Uh, so let me just very briefly uh, tell about my personal experience very briefly. I'm um, a quantum physicist, and I do theoretical research in interacting systems, I mean electrons in, in, in novel materials. Uh, so we, we, we program and we code a lot. Uh, I grew up in the north of Argentina in a very small town, and when I was finishing my high school, I really wanted to go in either to physics or to nuclear engineering. And uh, it was very tough for me because the, although my family was supporting me a lot, uh, the society is, was, was not responding, and on the contrary, they were sort of very critical to my, to my decision. They said this, uh, I was sort of weird. Uh, they would say, what are you going to do to study physics? What is that? Are you going to study nuclear engineering because you want to build a bomb? I mean, the people did not understand what I wanted to do. And, and I was even called uh, the atomic girl. 
which was not very nice for me. So, I mean, you, as a girl, you do not just go decide to go into science. You have to really go over a strong barrier. And this is uh, the, the message I want to convey. This has to change. Uh, now I am a professor at the, the Balseiro Institute in the south of Argentina, an atomics research center. I teach physics, and I'm also aiming at the, uh, at the quality education, so I'm also uh, teaching, um, I mean, of course, uh, university careers. But gender equality in science is very important. There are some slight changes. UNESCO is doing a lot, UNESCO with L'Oreal and other institutions, but there's a lot to do. The slope is very, very small. We really need a deep cultural change because the, the E, S, and C of UNESCO, education, science, and culture, they're deeply intertwined. And it's very important uh, to try to address women and to try to address also society. And we don't only need groups of women who are talking about our own problems. We need everybody. It's a, it's a problem of the whole society. Thank you, Karen. And you mentioned gender equality. Just to make things clear again, goal five and education, good education. I think all of you will say the same and quality education is goal four. Well, after that, you have to, to learn everything by heart. <laughs> Professor Elal, uh, you, you were a minister of education, so you, you, you know the problems. I know the problem, yes. From Egypt. <laughs> but I don't know if, uh, if I, uh, I can give this, the solution. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, first of all, I'm, I'm surrounded by physicists, you know, uh, um, even you yourself is a, is, is, is a in physicist. In the old days, yes. in the old days. In the old days, yeah. Uh, uh, in, in fact, I have prepared my intervention, uh, you know, last week, but uh, well, when I heard what has been said this morning, I said, no, I have to change what I should say uh, to you. And uh, you, we have talked a lot about the, the lessons learned from the, the uh, pandemic and the, 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 the importance of, of basic science, etc. Let me go to physics and ask you a question. Do you know how the pyramid was built? Do, do you, all of you knows, uh, you know, the, the, the Great Pyramid of Egypt, Cheops. Do you know how it was built? No one knows. Still a secret, you know? Uh, many, many hypotheses, not theories, because, uh, you know, I'm talking, uh, you know, under the control of physicists, you know, a theory is, is a theory when we can prove it. We, but all what has been said about the pyramids is not approved. Uh, we, we have used physics in order to, uh, uh, you know, scan or discover the pyramids. I think you know the muons. The, the particles, the muon particles that's coming from Mu the muons, muons, which go everywhere. Everywhere, and it has been discovered in 1930, if I'm, I'm, I'm correct. It's, it's uh, non-destructive, it's ha ha harmless. And scientists, when they discovered physicists, uh, particle physicists, when they discovered it, nobody knows what they will do with, but now, 90 years or maybe 70 years later, now we used it. We used the muon detectors, you know, either scintillator or gas detector or electronic, whatever you can, you can, you, you, you can say, in order to discover the pyramid. We put the uh, apparatus everywhere in the pyramid and we measured it. We measured the number of muons, the direction, and the, the, the uh, inclination, and we discovered a big void above the Grand Gallery in the pyramid. And we, we published it in Nature. You know, I think all of you know, knows what does it mean. You know, Nature uh, uh, accepted a publication in five weeks, you know, and now we are about to publish another one, you know, having another discovery with a new entrance to the Great Pyramid. Basic science, even if it has been many years ago not very useful, it becomes a very useful nowadays. Thank you. Th th thank you, Dr. Helal, to, to make us dream a little bit because the voids in the pyramids, mm, everybody wants to understand what was there in the old days. And I, 
I'm going to do a little bit of publicity for Science et Avenir and La Recherche, in which we published all this work. And what I would add, if I may, is that it helps for collaborations with French people, with, with Japan, and that's, that's, that's something, again, like partnerships that Barry uh, talked about. Yes, you know, just I, I didn't want uh, to take much more time because I, I great, almost said, great. Three, you know, it's an international mission, Egyptian, French, Canadian, Japanese, uh, and now German as well. Thank yes. you. Yes, so I hope our Chinese panelist is somewhere out of the sky and space, and that she can tell us what she does at Westlake University. Are you here, Dr. Rui Bai? One, two, three. What do the technical people say? Well, we'll try Francine Toumi from Congo, from Republic of Congo. Is she around? Uh, yes, do you hear ah, me? Ah, super. <laughs> Where are you? And tell us what you do and what kind of goals you're pursuing. We're, we're, we're listening to you. Good afternoon, everyone. I, and I'm so sorry to not be in Paris with all of you. So I'm a molecular biologist working on infectious diseases for the past 20 years. And I investigate human and pathogen interactions in order to better prevent or treat or control diseases like malaria and tuberculosis. And uh, if I have to give an example of a link between what I'm doing in the lab and the impact on the population, uh, I would yeah, cite one. Uh, working on uh, under five years old children on in fact, having severe diarrheal diseases, and we have uh, characterized the genotypes of the, the viruses before the introduction of uh, vaccine against rotavirus, and we have been able to provide data for the stakeholders to ensure that uh, the vaccine that would be introduced would be the, the appropriate one. So that's an example because sometimes, you know, when you work in the lab uh, and um, uh, yeah, people do not see the add value for the population. And of course, on malaria working uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, treatment for pregnant women is something also very important. And uh, so with regard to the sustainable goal, it's goal free, of course, <laughs> better health uh, and when we talk about the research, of course, uh, goal uh, 17, partnership. Yeah, also because everything uh, we have achieved here in Congo is in partnership with colleagues from Central Africa and from Europe and abroad. So yeah, that's what, what can I say? Goal three and goal 17 yeah. and, and, and maybe gender equality also. Oh, yes, but uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely, because I'm also engaged here in Brazzaville in uh, promoting yeah, more female, as mentioned by our colleague from Argentina, <laughs> more female in science, and uh, here in Congo only, uh, well, almost 12% uh, female in science. That's not, uh, that's not good. We, so, yeah, I promote, I, I, yeah, do some uh, mentorship and uh, some awards for for um, female um, students and yeah, we try and we engage the society and the scientists because we cannot achieve to have more female if the society is not engaged with scientists to really understand that we will not go to the development without females. So that. <laughs> That's my conviction. So and we try to share that with the population. And I may say it works. Now, more and more uh, parents are really pushing their girls to go into science. Thank you, Francine. You're very convincing. And uh, uh, Dr. Rui Bai, hello. I think you're there, finally. So tell us 
what you do and uh, which goals you are pursuing. Hello, Dr. Ribai. You call us from Westlake University. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. My network have a little problem just now, and now it's solved. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Ribai. Uh, it's really my honor to participate uh, in this roundtable. Uh, and I want to talk about the Go3 because my major is biology. Uh, I have been engaged in, in uh, scientific research just for seven years, since 2015. Uh, I think I'm a, a, maybe a junior res researcher. Yeah, and uh, I mainly focused on biology. Uh, my research is about uh, structure and uh, bio, bio, and so, uh, my research is about structure and uh, biochemical investigations of the spectrosome in order to reveal the mechanism of RNA splicing. Uh, splicing of the messenger RNA is very important step during human gene expression related to the central dogma. Uh, in human cells, more than 95% uh, of genes need to be spliced, and uh, at least 35% uh, uh, genetic disorder and many diseases such as uh, cancers and uh, real diseases are underlain by missplicing. So uh, in investigation of the splicing is one of the most fundamental and uh, significant problems in life sciences and uh, human health. Uh, it will establish the foundation to pathogenesis uh, of splicing related diseases and uh, provide insight into uh, drug development. And up to now, our team have resolved many important and uh, basic scientific questions about our splicing. And I have uh, enough confidence that our research will help drug development of the related diseases. Um, that's all. Dominic, may I add some, some more Th things? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ribai. Um, you're you're, you're uh, a little bit like Francine, uh, really involved in things which, which uh, uh, directly talk to the to the society, but that that was my second question. In fact, how do you manage to interact? You know, we heard this morning we heard uh, that well, scientists and politicians have to interact better. And uh, is it is it the better way? I wonder. Do you have to go through NGOs uh, to 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 have your message conveyed in another way? How do you manage? Uh, and and um, uh, so, sorry, um, uh, Fra Francine, when she, we, we had the feeling that associations, uh, foundations in, in society can help convey your message, you as, as scientists. Who wants to, to, to talk first? Karen? May, Karen? May, maybe yes, because I just want to clarify very shortly that the, the numbers of women in science Talk in uh, the microphone. The, the UNESCO, UNESCO says that one third, this was said this morning, one third of scientists are women. But it's, uh, if, if you look at certain areas in science, if you look at physics, uh, hard sciences, uh, mathematics, computer science, um, and engineering, the numbers are much lower, and it would be very good for UNESCO to discriminate because uh, when, when they talk about science, they include social sciences and also biological sciences where they have a larger amount of women. So it would be the um, the diagnosis in these sciences is even worse. So I think one has to really take that yeah. into, in, into account. Uh, with respect to your question, Dominique, uh, how uh, do I manage with some... I, I am very uh, um, keen on the idea that scientists must uh, engage, as it was said this morning also, with society in popularization, explaining what we do, uh, also engaging with governments and with the private sector. Um, 
let me just tell you uh, if, if what I do, for example, is to engage in policy making in, what is, in the Pugwash conferences for science and world affairs that were created by Albert Einstein and Bertrand Russell, so in, the, in 1957. And uh, they, this, is, this institution was created um, with the aim of um, gathering scientists, the military, um, diplomats, so sectors of the social society and the government to discuss in a rational way, using uh, scientific thinking, to discuss political problems. And also, uh, it, they were pioneering in bringing evidence of science to decision making. So this is why they got the Nobel Prize, in, the Peace Nobel Prize in 1955, because they opened channels of communication, which would be very good to restore these days given the current situation. So they, they really fostered communication between the West and, and the Soviet Union, union uh, to discuss nuclear disarmament in particular, but also other um, aspects of social responsibility of scientists, in particular the nuclear weapons and, and, uh, and reducing nuclear weapons. So how we use the scientific rationale to discuss political problems, this is another area where it, is, it would be very important for us scientists to engage also with politicians. And th this is why we need many more advisory boards, scientific advisory boards in every country. We need much more exchange between scientists and uh, policy makers. Dr. Halal, you were a minister of education, and these days, younger people, maybe not everywhere in the, in the world, but a lot of them, they're talking about the sus sustainable development. That's what, what they care about. So how do you manage to convey uh, uh, an important uh, a message like, well, you have to do mathematics and physics and chemistry and learn well if you really want to solve the problems. How do you do? Uh, it's a very difficult question, Dominique, and uh, let me give you a statistics uh, that is um, national and international at, at, you know, at the same time. And I think I have um, some of my colleagues here, including Professor Tokan, who has been also the Minister of Education in Jordan. and. Uh, uh, the difficulty is that if you look at the statistics, the students at the secondary school, even in, in France, everywhere, there are more than, it depends on the country, between 60 and 70 percent who, who prefer to go to social science rather than going to uh, science and math. This is a, a global statistics. You know, it, it varies from country uh, to, 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 to another. But, uh, and, and even if you look at the people who will go to the universities, you know, uh, and uh, uh, vocational and technical education, you will find the same thing. You know, the majority in higher education are 60 or 70 percent social science. What is the problem? The problem, you know, I has been, you know, I have been a scientist, and now I became a, a, again a scientist or maybe a manager of science. And I have been passing through different stages of, of society, politics, etc. I think there is a, a big role on us, the scientists, is that we are not addressing the, the correct message to the society. We have to attract this younger generation, not at the secondary school, not when they are, you know, already grown and, and, and they are going to the university, we should address them when they are at the basic education. You have to attract them. You have to, to, to deliver the messages. I think now, uh, you know, the media, social media, uh, technology allows us now to do anything. And the, 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 the kids, even one or two years, if, if you give the, uh, her or him uh, a phone, a mobile phone, they will, they will immediately look for what they would like to do. I think we scientists, we need to change our langu uh, language. Or in other words, we need to learn how to market and simplify and to get our results more attractive. So th does it mean that you have to be on Twitch or TikTok? Why not? Barry, uh, yeah. I, I would like to ask you a, a, another kind of question after what Karen said. Because what I, what I heard, at least in Brussels at times, that if you go to science diplomacy, 
you might lose some credibility as a scientist, you know. As soon as you approach the political sphere, people tend to think that you, you've become a political person. And is it, um, is it the right thing to believe you? When well. you're a scientist, people tend to think that you, well, after all, you're not, uh, you're saying important things. You're, you're, you're a Nobel Prize after, uh, yeah. after all. I, I don't, those labels don't. <laughs> Uh, I, I actually think the problem is what you said, but something Spe else speak also. Speak in the microphone, yeah. very close. I, I think the real problem that we're talking about, that you talked about, has another aspect, and that is that uh, I, I've dealt with a lot with many governments, not just the U.S. government, because what I do has a lot of resources, and so it's kind of what I have to do. And I think the real problem beyond the training and teaching and all this is that policy, there's too few technically and scientifically trained people that go into policy making occupations. And so if we have nobody that's making policy, I think the problem is gonna be there no matter how hard you try. So it seems to me part of our job is to train, train people scientifically and technically without some barrier that then they can't go into policy making occupations. The final solution, I think, is that, that the policy-making people, if they have sensitivity to science and technology, will make better decisions. Okay, Francine, you, you heard us. Uh, 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 Dr. Rui Bai, you heard us here. W would you like to react? Alors, Francine is speaking. Francine to me, uh, Francine, go <laughs> ahead. Yes. From Co Republic of Congo. Yes, yes, I do agree with what has been said. And uh, uh, really, scientists have to, yeah, to explain what they are doing and to be in politics, because your question, Dominique, I think uh, that's important. I, uh, they are not enough. Here in Africa, we do not have the critical mass of scientists, okay? but. At the same time, if we want to change, as mentioned by uh, our Nobel Prize, I mean, we need to, to, be, uh, to be in the game. We need to be in politics to, for be able to have an impact. Uh, one day, it's also the responsibility of scientists after many years of, like our minister, she, she was a scientist, he went to the politics and said, that's very, very important to have more people having different hearts. So I, uh, and to push the, the science agenda, we need to, to push this agenda. And for doing that, we have to go to politics because the, the stakeholders are those who make the decision as a scientist, we just have results. We have findings. And then how to translate findings into uh, practices, into policies. Ah, it's not our job. We need uh, uh, other, you know, comment dit ça, passer la main. Uh, so uh, we, need, we need, but the dialogue should be strengthened for sure between between uh, scientists and uh, politicians, but there are uh, uh, people working at Ministry of Public Health, etc. We need to better communicate and using social media to be in 2022 with use and explain what we are doing. Okay. Over. Do Dr. Dr. Ruibai, what, what do you think of all this? Do, do you have to fight uh, uh, as much as Francine seems to have to do? Um, yeah. mm, as a, because I'm a young researcher, and I think the answer of this question is, is also I want to know, because I think my uh, uh, in, impact of science is, uh, is is a very little, <laughs> and I, I, I don't know uh, how to uh, share my experience or uh, my uh, research, research uh, results. Uh, in my opinion, I just want to uh, participate in more and more uh, meeting and uh, to sh uh, share my uh, results and uh, communicate with uh, more and more people to um, 
uh, to uh, ma make make my research uh, uh, let many people know what uh, what we are doing now and uh, we will uh, help the human human health <laughs> and uh, uh, I I so I, it's really a great chance for me to learn to learn more about through uh, this this meeting and uh, in this part I think I'm maybe uh, like a listener and I have studied many in this part. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I'm sure you learn very fast. <laughs> Um, we, we, we have some, some minutes left, but not, not much. But, uh, pardon, je me mets à parler en anglais. I, I don't know, uh, did I speak in French or did I speak in, in, in English? I, I forgot. <laughs> Alors, je peux parler français, me dit-on, mais c'est absolument charmant. Merci, les interprètes. Nous terminerons cette session par... Euh, euh, une allocution de, j'espère qu'il est là dans la salle, le docteur Émile Bierumbor, qui conclura en évoquant les travaux de son grand-père Niels Bohr. But before we, we listen to this, uh, to this talk, um, I, 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 would, I would like to, to, uh, to, to, to ask a, a final question, and may, maybe Dr. Weibai will be very happy with what you, you will say, is finally, if you had to give an advice, well, we heard Francine in a way, but what advice would you give to younger scientists, uh, the one who come, and maybe they, they, they will live in a different world. Uh, so what is it? More education, more, 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 more communication, what, what is it? Dr. Hemiela. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, you know, I think very, uh, very brief, two messages. The first one is that there is only one science. Science has started from basic until the end. There is no basic science applied, science innovation, etc. It's one cycle. We have, you know, the, the young people, sh we should not say uh, basic science applied science. We should not distinguish between the different phases. It's one science. This is number one. Number two is partnership cooperation. Partnership is the key for progress. Thank you. Karen? Um, yes, thank you, Dominique. Uh, Karen, a physicist from Bariloche Atomic Center in Argentina. Uh, I want to reflect very briefly on something that has not been mentioned too much, which is education and critical thinking. Science is not only information and knowledge. Science is also a way of thinking. Science, science's values include uh, this, uh, arguments based on, on evidence, uh, a healthy amount of, of skepticism, which paradoxically leads to more trust. Think of misinformation. We need to be a little bit uh, skeptical always when we get information, because then we look for the appropriate uh, sources. Then we, uh, it's important to, to teach these skills to young uh, people since they are very, since the beginning, like we teach uh, physical skills. They also need to be trained in critical thinking, which is transversal to all the activities, to all aspects of life. It's not only privative to science. So independently of what they are going to follow, they have to learn these skills that come from, from mainly from science. It also includes, very briefly, uh, not only uh, skepticism and evidence, but also intellectual honesty. It also includes uh, the possibility of lateral thinking, of in inventiveness, of inspiration or creativeness. And this also has to do with politicians, for example, how we find, how we have lateral thinking to find results by thinking in another way, by looking at different possibilities, different paths. Uh, where we also need to be much more rational, uh, more logic. We, we should be able to understand complex um, uh, pieces of literature, for example, when we have to be more quantitative. Uh, so, I mean, these are important skills. Again, I insist my main message and one of my worries is that we do have to uh, train young people in critical thinking because science is much more than information and knowledge. Science is also a way of thinking. Okay. Francine, I, I saw that you, you agreed, but you have maybe your own message. 
No, just to add to what has been said, multidisciplinary approach, not to, you know, to work only molecular biology, uh, entomology, to work to have really transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary approach. That would be Thank you, addition. thank you, Francine. And, and maybe it's not that easy because the languages of different sciences is not always the same. Barry, maybe you give the, the last word. Okay. I actually think the statements just made on critical thinking are the most important in this hour, personally. I look at it a little bit differently. I, I think somehow when people are young, we need to treat, teach them what we're very good as, as scientists, and that's we're very analytical about how we look at the world. Critical thinking always seems so technical, but I think it's being analytical uh, about how you approach anything, whether it's how to drive from here to somewhere else and how you solve the traffic. If people in policy-making positions are anywhere in life, we're more analytical as we are as scientists, doing whatever they do, whether it's science or not, we'd all be much better off. In fact, I, I just have a last question. What will you do tomorrow or the day after? What is your next goal? You My go back to Argentina? I, I have to go back. I have to write a paper. <laughs> and, I ha and I have to discuss with, with my student, which is a female student doing her PhD with me. And what will you do, uh, Annie? Continue coordination of the project. <laughs> OK. Barry, back I'm to taking a long flight back to California, <laughs> and then three days later going to Crete. OK. Francine, ba ba back to the lab. Uh, no, to fight to have more financial support to research in Africa. <laughs> okay. Rui, back to the lab after you listen to everybody. Uh, <laughs> my next goal is uh, to continue to do the research related to human health. And I hope Maris can help promote the treatments and the drugs of uh, many diseases especially cancers and uh, rare diseases. <laughs> that's, that's very important. I think we can have a round of applause for, for what you told us, and I hope it helps. Thank you very much. Thank you.